I guess, you know, I think that I'm a product of music because my parents met through their love of music. My father was playing in a Hawaiian band and my mother was a fan of Polynesian music. And um, she actually had a fan club in Amsterdam before she went to England. And they, they met through a mutual friend with, where my dad was playing in this band and my mum was a fan. So, and my mum loved singing. So I think that I was always surrounded by that sound, by music, and um, even church, singing in church. Um, I grew up as a Catholic, went to Catholic schools, so that was a big part of it, that choral singing. And then um, at high school, I joined the Kapahaka group. So um, that was a, an incredible way of expression and cultural expression, even though I wasn't Māori. I hadn't even thought about a musical career or recording. It was just one of those moments where you, you go, oh yeah, okay. And I was a bit, sort of probably just a little bit casual about the whole thing. And when we went to go and record it at, um, what is it, it's, it's the old York, York Street Studios, um, we, we had lots of fun. And we even joked at the time, wouldn't it be funny if this was number one? And you know, we never ever really thought that it would be, you know, when you're recording something, you always go, oh, this is going to be the best, or this is going to do well. But, um, so I think that whole experience of that song um, uh, was a good one in terms of the, the stars were aligned, the energy was good, and the intent was good, I think. And it was a great song to sing because, you know, um, my father was a school teacher. I was born in 1967. So there were all sorts of things that kind of um, aligned with that track, yeah. It was cr pretty crazy when To See With Love went to number one. Um, I think it's because, although we kind of pr joked about it, we didn't expect it. And um, I'm not sure if I was necessarily ready for it either. Um, but, you know, there were a lot of good things that happened. I think that there were lots of communities that really sort of, um, uh, I guess, they took me on as their own, particularly the Māori and Pacific community. I remember going down to Porirua, and at that stage, doing in-stores was kind of just a new thing, and I went down to the mall there to perform um, on a Saturday, and it was absolutely packed and that's when you kind of went oh my gosh <laughs> there are people that actually really do like it it's not it's not kind of made up so um, there were some really good experiences I think my highlights of the department oh there's so there's actually too many <laughs> I, don't, I mean I don't know where to start but you know if, when we started in the department there was no New Zealand, New Zealand on air the money just kind of went to TVNZ and they divvied it up where it was going. So there was far more opportunity, I think, for um, Māori programs to be developed. And Ernie was always on to that. You know, during that time, you know, he created Herauraua Cooking Show. We did Radio Whāwaho, which was, you know, a pretty crazy uh, attempt at uh, comedy, Māori drum, you know, comedy. Um, that we, we did experiment with a few things, but then I guess once the money, the funding became competitive, it was actually a lot harder to get um, things through. Um, but the fact, I think, that the programs have survived is a real testament to what they created. They were both two very different personalities as well. Um, Ernie was... He was very much an ideas man and he was always coming up with something and trying to push things through. And um, Fire was more reserved, but he did the same things in a different way. I mean, I think now Fire would be going, he'd I mean, would he be laughing? Would he be going like this? He, for years he fought to get, you know, uh, presenters at TVNZ to pronounce Māori words correctly. He would do charts, he would do lessons, 
and you know it was he was pushing it up hills, battle up hills sometimes, and um, for, to see things now thirty years on, where there's quite a cultural shift there, people are taking care. I mean, I think this, the lessons that Scotty's doing at TVNZ apparently their classes are full. <laughs> there's a waiting list, so I think that um, that's all part of what he and Uni created. Being able to tell our stories with our perspective through our eyes is really, really important. And I think that that's um, something that I've really learnt over those years. You know, the, the show covers um, such a range of things and, um, and we do a lot of stories that nobody else, no mainstream media would ever touch. And, um, and we, we're, we're always looking at trying to um, include the language um, across all our Pacific islands. And um, yeah, I think to me, seeing issues raised and seeing um, the, uh, our community um, being recognised um, is a huge part of why I enjoy working on Tangata Pacifica. We wanted to tell the story really because Dad was not well and we always thought, you know, his story was an interesting one um, and the fact that He'd always wanted us to go there. He talked about it our entire lifetime, and that we'd never managed to do it. So I think that that story was important to tell because other people related to it. And when it's screened, and we you know it's online, um, the feedback has always been, "I didn't realise." was that hard, easy to do or I really want to do that because my father's sick and I need to go there and or I've never been there and thanks for sharing this. I think there's always room for improvement. I'd really like to also see some more language being involved in some of that representation. Um, to try and get away from the negative and focus on the positive uh, stories that, you know, are reflective of our communities. And I think when, they, when our communities see that, they can only get better. Um, it's about inspiring and empowering. So, yeah, there's definitely room for more, more faces, more stories to be on our screens and that's across every platform.